symbolism is a funny thing. Symbolism is arbitrary. That's pretty true. But there's a reason that we choose things to be symbolic for other things uh, over and over and over again through paintings, through writing, poetry. So when we find... What I'm saying is that symbolism might be one of these things that tells us something about ourselves without us being cognizant of the fact. Why do we choose X to symbolize 2, right? You see what I'm saying? We have a case of that with these two poems, one from Emily Dickinson, one from Charles Bukowski. Welcome to Strip Cover Lit where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature, I'm Adrian Fort, and we are here for a poetry discussion, which will take place in three separate playlists. Number one, the poetry discussion playlist. Number two, the Emily Dickinson playlist. And number three, the Charles Bukowski playlist. I want to preface these poems by discussing a little bit about what a bluebird normally is used to symbolize. If you were to pluck Bluebird out of a symbolic reference book, a, a uh, dictionary of symbols, oftentimes the Bluebird is used to represent maybe in the most hallmark fashion possible hope, right? But also beyond that, joy, but also beyond that, just general positivity, but also beyond that, renewal. Now, with those things in mind, let's take a trip through these two poems and remember those things. This first poem before you Thought of Spring by Emily Dickinson. Before you thought of spring, except as a surmise, you see God bless his suddenness, a fellow in the skies of independent hues, a little weather-worn, inspiriting habiliments of indigo and brown, with specimens of song as if you, as if for you to choose, discretion in the interval, with gay delays he goes, to some superior tree without a single leaf, and shouts for joy to nobody but his seraphic self. So, habiliments, like a suit of armor, seraphic, Roughly angelic, kind of, right? Um, for visuals, that's kind of what you, you, can, you can look at there. So, before you thought of spring, before you had even thought of spring, you see this bluebird, and you know spring is coming. But this bluebird isn't just there. I mean, you don't just see the bluebird. You hear his songs. And then what he does, in true Sigma fashion, he shouts to joy to, for joy to nobody but his seraphic self. Hashtag Sigma male grind set. And while we're referencing Sigma males, let's go to Bluebird by Charles Bukowski. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay in there. I'm not going to let anybody see you. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I pour whiskey on him and inhale cigarette smoke, and the whores and the bartenders and the grocery clerks never know that he's in there. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay down. Do you want to mess me up? Do you want to screw up the works? You want to blow my book sales in Europe? 
There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too clever. I only let him out at night sometimes, when everybody's asleep. I say, I know that you're in there, so don't be sad. Then I put him back, but he's singing a little in there. I haven't quite let him die, and we sleep together like that, with our secret pact and it's nice enough to make a man weep. But I don't weep. Do you? Now, remember, through these two poems, that bluebirds are um, representative of joy, positivity, hope. Certainly in Bluebird by Charles Bukowski here, hope is present towards the end. We understand that our speaker is acting tough. He's not too tough. And here in the Emily Dickinson poem, before you even think of spring, you see that bluebird knowing that better, better times, better weather, it's coming. But there is an added element to these poems, isn't there? We have, with gay delays he goes to some superior tree, without a single leaf. Our bluebird is choosing a little bit of, a little bit of challenge here. There's no leaves in there for safety or for cover, to break the wind to hide you from the, the hawks, and shouts for joy to nobody. It's his life mission. It's what he wants to do. But his seraphic self, it is his life mission. It is what he wants to do, and that's good enough for him. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I only let him out at night sometimes when everybody's asleep. I say, I know you're there, so don't be sad. Then I put him back, but he's singing a little in there. I haven't quite let him die. And we sleep together like that with our secret pact. It's nice enough to make a man weep, but I don't weep. Do you? The bluebird in Bukowski's heart doesn't care that Bukowski is covering him in whiskey. He doesn't care that the whores and the bartenders and the grocery clerks don't get to see him or know him. He doesn't care that our speaker is too tough for that bluebird. He's doing his business, baby. He's got a song to sing, and he's going to sing it. But our speaker in the Emily Dickinson poem doesn't reference anyone else. Our speaker in the Charles Bukowski poem seems to be isolated on purpose. Our bluebird in the Charles Bukowski poem is doing his own thing at his own pace, in his own way, no matter that people are trying to pour whiskey on him, etc. Our bluebird in the Dickinson poem, he's going to find that tree that he wants. No leaves? No matter. I've got a song to sing, and I'll do it. Positivity, renewal, hope, joy. But there's an added element in these poems. Positivity, renewal, hope, joy. Those are the hallmark sentiments here. There is a sense in both of these poems of defiant individualism. That bluebird, he's got a mind of his own. But I don't think we often associate a term like, for example, strident autonomy 
the way you might describe the bluebirds here, stridently autonomous. We don't associate those words, that term, that sentiment, stridently autonomous. We don't associate that often with a word like joy. Do we? Is joy something that you do alone? Is joy something that loners have? When you imagine the Sigma male, the Sigma male grind set, right? When you imagine the starving artist creating on their own, she's alone painting that painting, he's alone writing that novel, do you imagine them joyful? Is positivity, even, a term that you think of when you imagine those individuals hopeful? But maybe, maybe that other term there, renewal. Here's the thing. Bluebirds are often associated with being early harbingers of all things spring. Before you even had the thoughts of spring, before you even had the thoughts of it, there was, God bless a fellow in the skies of independent hues, a little weather-worn. Hence, spring, bluebirds' association with renewal, with hope. Renewal and hope going hand in hand. What could be, if we're going to use that term stridently autonomous, if we're going to use defiant individualism in association with the bluebird, what could be more stridently autonomous? What could be more defiantly individualistic than rebuilding the self? If we're talking about symbols, some of the oldest symbols we have are light and dark, night and day, the changing of the seasons, and how we are able to graft those things onto the human experience. S the summer of your life is when you're doing all of the hard work and making all of the progress. The fall of your life is when you are reaping the benefits of what you have put in. The winter of your life is your downfall. The winter of your life is death. The spring of your life is your youth. And we can think of all things in this way. Essentially, if, if you want to break it down a little bit different, it's the hero's journey. What are we doing in our youth? We're building the self. How many people really... So, so when, you, when you think of youth, uh, think high school, for example. Think 14 through 18, something like that. 13 through 19, something like that. How many of you really fit in during that time? How easy is it to just go with the flow during that time? Would that or would that not have been one of the times in your life where you were more stridently autonomous? Don't help me, Mom. I don't want to be seen in public with you. Right? That sort of thing, that sort of sentiment runs rife during the spring of your life. But it doesn't have to be the entire life broken down in that way. We can break down segments of life in that way. These things are more nebulous, but there are occasional winters in your life. There are occasional summers in your life. Think back to the last winter you had. 
I don't mean actual winter. I don't mean if you were past winter in your life, you're you're not here to hit that like button, right? But what I mean is the last time you really went through it. The last time it felt like the world was caving in around you. What did you do? You hunkered down. You went through the darkness. The days were shorter. It was cold. You felt alone. And then... Spring hit. And what did, what do you want to do when you're coming out of these winter seasons in your own life? Besides flaunt the individual that you are. That is hopeful. That is being renewed. Maybe that is where joy and positivity are really rooted in the confidence that we build through defiant individualism, through strident autonomy. That is all I have for this episode. If you like or appreciate what it is that I do on the channel, hitting the like button really does help me out as it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance, but not design, there's poetry on the channel every Monday. I do novel read-alongs. I do, I just wrapped up James Joyce's Dubliners, a read-along for that, going through Hemingway's short stories. Now, right now on Mondays, we're going through all of Sylvia Plath's works. So I hope to have you back for all of those videos as well.